So now that we've established that America will continue to play an outsized role in the events prophesied in the Bible, we must ask, who else is involved? <laughs> and what does it mean to be fallen from God, like the Bible says? Is there anything we can do to recover from a fallen position? And how does recognizing that condition help us to navigate the messy world until Jesus comes? Welcome to today's show called Babylon the Great is Fallen, where we will see just how broad and all-encompassing this wicked biblical ruler really is. Happy Hump Day, everybody. It is Wednesday, and we are here to help you get through this middle part of your week. Uh, we are doing so against the backdrop of this ongoing war in Israel, but this week is much more prophetic than our previous weeks looking at that conflict, and today will not be any different. We're going to spend some time in the book of Revelation and um, a little bit of time in the book of Galatians in the context of the article that we're going to read. But today will be a day of theology and prophecy, so go get those prophecy hats and let's get started. What does it mean to fall from grace? So since Monday, we have been discussing this problem about Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. In fact, let's let's start our show there today. Revelation chapter 14. We looked at this on Monday, but let's look at it again. Um, verse 8 is the second of three messages that are back to back here in uh, chapter 14, starting in verse 7, and the setup to that is verse 6 all the way down to verse 12, really. Um, it's a set of three messages, and verse 8 is the second one. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Uh, we're going to see what is the nature of her fornication before we're done uh, with the show today. But we have we, what we get from this is that she's fallen from... I, by the way, yeah, I'm saying she because the verse itself uses that female pronoun for her because she has made all nations drink. Now, what did we learn yesterday? What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? It represents a church. And so this is some sort of church. And if you took the time to really study it, then some sort is, you can be much more specific than that. But this is a church who at least at one point claimed to know God, but she's fallen from that position. And the nature of that, we'll see more specifically soon, but just from this verse, she has an influence over all of the nations, right? So she's clearly very powerful, very globally powerful. And with that influence, she makes everybody drunk, right? The wine of the wrath of her fornication. So she's done something against God and the consequences of that are called wine and she's feeding it to everybody in the world and the whole world becomes drunk because of her. What a mess. So what does it mean to be fallen? That's, that's where we're going in the article for today. Um, what does it mean to be fallen from grace? This article is dated October 13 of this year, so it's pretty new, and the, the website is BibleStudyTools.com. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this with this uh, website, but at least this article is pretty good, so maybe I'll check it out more. What I'm doing is jumping down to the first major section here. The, the headline of the section is, What Does Fall From Grace Mean? <laughs> very on the nose, right? <laughs> it tells us, some definitions of this phrase begin to shed light on where we need to go, but still fall well short of properly establishing the true nature and scope of this important truth. Of this phrase, fall from grace, the free dictionary says it is, quote, to sin and get on the wrong side of God. Okay. Wikipedia expands upon this definition by saying, quote, the transition of the first man and woman from a state of innocent obedience to God to a state of guilty disobedience. Okay. And then uh, it goes on to say, to gain a full understanding of what it means to fall from grace, we must start in the book of Galatians. So let's pause there, okay? Time out. The definitions that we have already read, as well as a couple more earlier on in the, in the article, 
they really focus on the kind of colloquial conversational way that we use that phrase. Like I used to enjoy some sort of position and now I don't anymore. So I have fallen from grace, right? I, I made a professional blunder. I got canceled on the internet or whatever, right? Uh, something happened and I'm no longer as uh, of a high stature as I used to be. And to some degree, that's that's Babylon also. I mean, she is great, this city that is going to have an influence over the entire world. She's clearly a great city, uh, but she will not be. When Jesus comes, he will destroy her and bring her down to nothing. But it's not only that, because even while she's enjoying her global power, she is still called fallen, right? So we really have to understand the kind of biblical Galatians definition of being fallen from grace, because that is the fullness of Babylon's problem. So the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. So it sets up a conflict here between the law of God and the grace of God. And if you are of the mentality that looks to the law of God for your justification, um, we'll get back to what that means in a moment, but therefore you are not looking to the grace of God for your justification, which is bad because it is the grace of God from which you get justification, biblically speaking. So let's uh, actually jump down in the article because the next major section is how is a person justified and what does that even mean? Um, the first paragraph there says to fall from grace is to fall headlong into the error of the Judaizers, which... I'm going to just stop there and say that's really unfortunate language, given the broader topic of what we're discussing this week. Um, I know why it uses that language, because in, in the day of Jesus Christ, his primary religious enemies were the Jewish leaders. <laughs> so, yeah, it was those who are attempting to push the rituals of Judaism onto the Christians who don't believe they're following the law. But I'm just saying in the context of this kind of anti-Semitism problem, that is an unfortunate word to use right now at this moment in time. Okay. To fall from grace is to fall headlong into the error of the legalists. I'm going to use a different word. Okay. And that was and is to believe that our righteousness can be secured and maintained through a mixture of law and grace. That's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible said it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is a gift from God, not of yourself, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That comes from uh, Galat uh, not Galatians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. I just I don't have that one in front of me. I just did it off the top of my head. But that's where you get it. So when you are trying to get to heaven, when you're trying to be made right through God, through some other method than what God has said, right? His grace, that you will live with him forever simply because he wants you to. When you go to any other reason, you are fallen from grace. Are you saying, yeah, I know that you said it works this way, God, but I like this way better. Okay. I like, here's an example that I use. Uh, I've used it many times preaching and it's an absurd example on purpose to get the point across. Okay. God says it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Uh, it is not of yourself. It's a gift from God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then you read that and you say, okay, God, that sounds great, but I want to take the bus to heaven instead. All right, so you go out to the bus stop and you wait. How long are you going to be waiting at the bus stop to get to heaven? You're going to wait till the end of the world because the bus doesn't go to heaven, does it? No, no. Now you can stomp your feet and get all mad at God and say, God, but I want to take the bus to heaven. I like that better. But the bus will never come to get you and bring you to heaven, because that's not how God said it works, right? God said it's A, therefore we have to do A. And lucky for us, doing A is nothing of ourselves in the first place, right? It's all God, it's his grace. So let's go back to the Bible. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17, okay? And we're going to see this in action. How did Babylon fall from grace? Not just from 
a higher position to a lower one, but how did it turn its back on God's grace in the first place? Revelation 17, and we're going to uh, start in verse 2, I guess. Verse 1 sets up the context. Some angels are coming to John, who's getting this whole vision and writing it down for us. And they tell him that they're going to show him the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And then verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So right away, we got that, that uh, language match drunk with the wine of her fornication. So chapter 14, verse eight says, Babylon the great is fallen and has made the whole world drunk with the wine of her fornication. And then here we're seeing this harlot woman sitting on um, many waters, it says, although in verse three, she's also sitting on a beast. But this harlot woman has some wine that she has made the world drunk uh, with the wine of her fornication. So Babylon and this woman, this harlot woman are the same. Now the harlot woman is not the same as the pure woman in chapter 12 that we learned about yesterday. In fact, they are, they are really opposites of one another. They represent different things, but this harlot woman, let's read about her in verse three and onward. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast now, here's a shortcut for you. That's the same beast from Revelation 13, verses 1 through 4. Okay, the same exact one. Which was full of names of blasphemy. There you go. What is the definition of blasphemy? It is something that is opposed to God. It's it's um, an arrogance toward God. Like, oh, I know you say I'm saved by grace, but I want to take the bus. Mm -mm. You know, that kind of a thing, right? So it's it it's a blasphemous beast, and she's sitting on top of it, riding it around like a cowboy on a horse. You know, it's going where she wants it to go. Verse four: The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. That's not good. Her cup is full of all sorts of ugliness, and the filthiness of her fornication. Wow. And so in that cup is, is her wine. That wine consists of a bunch of abominations and all the filthiness of her fornication. And that is what she is making the world drink and get drunk on. Now, what is her fornication specifically? Go back to verse two for that one. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. So she's a church. She is supposed to be more interested in the things of heaven. She is supposed to teach you that your home is not here. And yet she's doing the opposite. She is getting in bed with the kings of the earth because she likes her money. She likes her power. She likes her politics. She wants to be in charge of everything. That is the filthiness of her fornication. When the church gets involved in politics, bad things always happen. The entire Middle Ages are proof of that. So all of the bad things that happen because she wants to sleep around with the world, all of that is mixed up in her cup of wine, as well as all the abominations of the world. And all you got to do is read your way through the book of Leviticus. You'll see there's a ton of abominations in the world. And all of that is in this intoxicating mixture that she is shoving down your throat. Now watch. Verse 6 makes it even worse. I saw the woman... Drunk with what? With the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She persecutes God's people in the name of God. Have mercy. That's about as far fallen from grace as you can be. So you probably have noticed that I'm building toward something as I often do here on the show. So the conclusion for today is no bigger than the one I've already given you. I just want us to understand what Babylon is. I'm not even going to who she is. That's not for this show, but what she is. She is a religious political entity that cares much more for the things of the world, the politics, the money, the power, than she does anything about the kingdom of heaven. 
And when you, people like you or I, when we stand up and say, hey, but this is not the kingdom of heaven, her response is that she's more interested in drinking our blood, so to speak, right? She is more interested in taking our lives to get us out of the way than she is to listen to a single piece of gospel truth. She's bad. But every bad thing that she does is in the name of God. She masquerades as a church that is loyal to God. All right, friends. I made this suggestion that this is where we're headed. That we, the United States of America, is part of Babylon. It's not the fullness of this woman, but if we studied out chapter 13, we see that this country enters into a partnership with her as her false prophet, so to speak. That's what's coming. And if you don't want to be part of that, then you have to check your heart right now. And if you're out there participating in this hatred against the Jews, it's time to quit. It's not too late to ask God for forgiveness. It's not too late to understand what he is doing and to align your life with him. But it will be too late eventually, friends. It really will. So let's not waste another moment. Let's pray right now. Loving Father in heaven, we don't want to be against you. We don't want to even be on a road that is separate from you. We want to be exactly where you want us to be, square right in the middle of your will. So even if we mess up a little bit and we go too far to the left or too far to the right, we are so much right in the middle of your will that we never stray into danger. Father, it is a sobering idea to see that this epitome of evil is coming and it will have worldwide power and worldwide influence It will do so in your name and it will persecute your people. So protect us against that, Father, and use us in the meantime to reach as many as possible, to turn as many souls toward you and your kingdom as we can by your grace, to save people from this horror that is coming. Bless us, Lord, with wisdom as we live through these last days and keep us safe and forgive our sins above all. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Amen. All right. Okay. So we got one more piece in this puzzle and then Friday is an AI update. So make sure you're subscribed. Okay. If you're on Facebook, please like this, uh, like the page where you're watching this. On YouTube, you want to subscribe to the channel and also hit your notification bell. On Rumble, please hit your follow button. That's how you subscribe there. On Locals, you're you're already subscribed, right? If you're watching this on Locals, you're part of the community. Hallelujah. But you want to prayerfully consider being a paid supporter as well. That really helps us a lot. You can also go to talkingdonkeyinternational.org slash podcast. You have our whole archive there. And you know, make a reminder for yourself to keep listening because I will have uh, more, more places to find us coming up soon. God bless you. Hope you have a good night and I'll see you back here for part four of Fallen from Grace. Recording stopped.